One generation shall love your works, O God, and declare your mighty acts to the next generation. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness. They shall sing aloud of your righteousness, O Lord. Uh, in the church directory. 
Uh, if you would please turn in your uh, bulletin to the, uh, the prayer of confession, and let us open our minds and hearts to the grace and mercy of God. God of our ancestors in the grave, we are thankful for our spiritual heritage, but too often we rest on the world of the past rather than taking responsibility for our own faithfulness in the present. We forget that God is able to raise up stones on the ground and children of Abraham for the praise of God's name. We have allowed our lives to make us forget our prayers. Forgive us and teach us to rely on your grace, knowing in Jesus Christ. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is the everlasting, everlasting. God's mercy is ever fail. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Friends, believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are the new creation. Your cleanser, Clan McNabb. Clan Blair. McClure Clan McLeod of Harris. Clan McAllister. Clan Douglas. Clan Beard. Clan McIntyre. Clan Blair. Clan McDonald. Clan McDonald. Clan Bailey. Clan McFarland. Clan McCarter. Let us start. Friends, would you join me in prayer? Oh my God, we remember our heritage. We remember people in the past who have guided us into the present. Help us to remember the struggles that they had, the ways that you were there with them, working for liberation, for life, for hope, for light. Holy and gracious God, we are blessed with this heritage, and we ask that we continue this heritage to move into the future. Standing for justice and peace and hope, praying for those who are oppressed and 
asking your grace, your guidance, and your light for all human beings that we might live in the light that you give to us in Jesus Christ. We give you our thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Yay, there we are. There, there is a lot, lot no, 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 friends. There, there is, is a lot, lot going, going on this morning. We are celebrating our heritage, and, and we are also continuing our creation celebration, which celebrates our work and the responsibility that we all have to take care of it. Now, now I would like our, our friends to up here, turn around and look and look at those creatures that are on the wall. What are those? And specifically, thank you. Yes, they are not our butterflies. And I think monarch butterflies are pretty amazing. They are pollinators, so they help our vegetables and our fruits and our flowers grow and continue to grow through their different cycles. Another thing I like, especially about monarchs, is their markings. They are very, they're very vivid colors and their markings, and you know, sometimes that serves to protect them from predators, but the things that want to eat them, they see those colors and they think, hmm, that might be poisonous, I'm going to stay away from that. One of the amazing things about monarchs that I have learned is that every year when it starts to get cold, they migrate. They go to where it's warmer, and I read that sometimes that can be as much as 10,000 miles that these butterflies fly. So, so I looked up how wide Nebraska is. Nebraska is 430 miles wide. So that would be like a little butterfly flying almost five times across our state to get to a warmer climate. And then, even more amazing, when it gets warmer, they come back. So they somehow know where to fly. And they lay their eggs. And, and then they die, and that's, that's their cycle. cycle. And, and one thing that we can do to partner with God and be kind and well-being is to help create habitat for these monarchs. We, we can plant the kinds of plants that they like. Um, we, we can uh, learn more and learn what those plants are. One thing, you know what one plant is monarch especially like? Yes. yes. Exactly. Milkweed. You can plant milkweed in your yard. Now, when, when I was younger, my family made a butterfly house. This is, this is the one, one, but you, you can get, get this at an ice cream shop. shop. It's a three-gallon ice cream container. We, we cleaned it out really well. We, we cut more of those so that, that we could see the amazing transformation that the caterpillars go through. So, so you can do that yourself. And my family made one, Rachel's going to hold this. We, we made one ourselves a few years ago. ago. Now, we, we had fun with this. We, we decorated on the outside, outside and, and we put windows. And, and so, so last year, we had seven caterpillars that we watched go through their transformation. And it was amazing. It was like peeking in on a secret. So, so I, I have a question, though. Do you think that the caterpillars care what about all these shiny things? Do you think they care about that? We don't. We really enjoyed it. We had fun with it, and we can too. But really, the butterflies just need, they need milkweed. They need stick it to crawl so they can attach and form their chrysalis. And then there's silence and stillness, which we were able to see in them. So before you go down to Sunday school or back to your parents, will you please bow your heads with me? Dear God and Creator, you made butterflies and you made us. We are both strong and delicate at the same time. Thank you for letting us be partners with you to care for our earth and to be welcoming to all who live in it. And let all God's children say, Amen. Please come forward. 
uh, and receive the Lord's offering. offering. And as they're doing that, I just want to share with the congregation uh, what a wonderful time we had at Camp Calvary with the Confirmation Retreat this weekend. I'll also ask how glad I am to be inside after the Confirmation class this weekend. Please go ahead and receive the offering. Uh, but, but, but as, uh, as, as, as we, we celebrate that, that, I just, uh, I I just want to say thank you to all of the youth leaders who went this weekend, weekend to all the youth who went, went uh, and I want to say thank you to the congregation. It is so moving uh, to be part of the education of the young people of this congregation. Uh, they are such amazing people. In a few weeks, you'll be able to hear their statements of faith. Uh, and and uh, I, I think, think you will be uh, moved as I have been, been, but I am just so grateful to this, this congregation for its support of the ministries uh, of the children of this congregation. We worship God uh, with our tithes and offerings, and those offerings help to support the many ministries that we have with children and youth at Westminster. Or all the hills, ye dribble a lot of my stair roots to slacken, 
a dark girl with a neck to which it's five and ten minutes to go. A while I've been in court, feeling spirited and weary, I thought that I'd never been a baby like the weed. He saw me in the family, and he managed to be the next to me. He got me by the past, but he can't stand for me. I knew the minute they did, and I'm doing it with all fear. So close to me, I've got it, and it's all I'm going to talk. Who this or who that? Oh, the red is in the sea, and it's really not bad, and I don't want to take it off. The valley is there, and it's where I need to spread it. Through all through the darkness, I'll be open for a tree. When you're the God, and in the dark, you will help me to spread it. Then will it try to stay gruesome all three. For falling in the presence of foes that surround me, my separate table is sent into the spread. The tiny and the myrtle fall straight and salute me. He brings a blue cup and pours oil on my head. Surely goodness and mercy, despite all my Romans, will guide me to the very good of the earth. I own it in an ear with an earring woman. I will bow in the name of my Savior forever. The word of the Lord. The epistle for today in the second Corinthians from the hand of the Apostle Paul. Listen for God's word. We do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness to the children of our hearts to give the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have the treasure in place of ours, so that we may be clear of this extraordinary power that does belong to God and does not come to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. The word of the Lord. And I'm reading from the Gospel according to Luke in the 18th chapter. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all of my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up into heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his own justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, may the word in my mouth, the meditation in each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Stops are reputed to be good. Cross stealing. But worship in their church is so cold you can skate on it. Well, perhaps there have been times, at least in the past, when that was partially true. There's a story about a Baptist from the American South who took a vacation to Scotland. And the cousin of the he was, who was singing weekly, when suddenly all around he saw out a church in which he worshiped. The town in which he was staying had three Presbyterian churches in Scotland, congregations, uh, and, and one Roman Catholic chapel. chapel. So he decided he'd go to the altar in the center of town. 
He was pleasantly surprised. And the sermon started by the Presbyterian minister was preaching about the biblical sermon. A man! The voice of the three minutes, he called out, Amen! A few A few moments moments later, the minister had another great great point, he thought, and so he said, Praise the Lord! An usher rushed over to his his heel and tapped him on the shoulder and and said, We we did not raise the Lord in this certain time. Well, actually, actually, we tried to. The reporter who most influenced the Presbyterian form of government in the Scottish Church is a man we would certainly call a doer. The level of the leader here, stern, solemn, austere, John Knox. On Reformation Sunday in October, we often talked to Martin Luther and John Calvin in Germany and Switzerland, who were the fathers of Reformation in Europe. But what about the this corner of the church? Up there, you know, off the North Sea. What do we know about John Knox? Well, first of all, we don't even know when he was born. Probably around 1513. So, in that case, if that were true, he would have been four years old when Martin Luther packed up his famous 95 pieces on the church door at Wittenberg. He was educated at the University of Glasgow and earned a degree at the University of Sanders in 1531 and became a Roman Catholic priest and served as a tutor and priest to landed families at least until 1543. But in 1545, with the influence of uh, these uh, Lutheran ideas coming over from Germany, Knox publicly confessed himself to be a Protestant sympathizer. He attached himself to the early reformer George Weiser and sort of Weiser Dover. But then Weiser was summoned to answer the heresy charges in the city of St. Andrews before Archbishop Cardinal Beaton. Weiser told Knox not to follow him that day. He said, honestly, one life today is sufficient sacrifice. Good advice from Weiser for he was, later that day, burned at stake. Within weeks, Protestants had stormed the castle and had done similarly to Cardinal Beaton. Uh, I'm afraid it was rather by the time. For some months, the Scottish reformers held the hands of the castle, but then a French frigate came with French troops to storm the castle and knock them on the others who were forced to serve as rowers on French galley ships. For 19 months, he served as slaves in the French Navy. But then the English government, under the precocious King Edward VI, intervened. Edward had become king at only the age of nine in 1547. And his intervention with Frank brought Knox to freedom and to England, where he served as chaplain of the king. In this role, Knox argued before the English Privy Council for certain changes in the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. He wanted the unicans, the Lord's Supper, to receive while seated rather than the kneeling so that they uh, wouldn't uh, look like they were adoring the elements. Well, Knox did not get his way completely in the subsequent 1552 of the Common Prayer um, because he was not removed, per se. However, there is a black rubric, as it's called. The other rubric, the instructions to the worshippers, are in red. But the black rubric says that if the elements were to be received, quote, with humble and grateful acknowledgement of the benefits of Christ given to the worthy Redeemer, but do not imply any adoration of bread and wine or the presence of Christ's natural flesh and blood. That was the influence of Knox on the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. Unfortunately, Edward, the young king, was sickly and died at the age of 15 in 1553, and his older, much older, half-sister, Mary Tudor, came to the throne and began arresting and executing leaders of the Protestants. And Ox wisely fled to Geneva, Switzerland. And there Ox, who 
I've got a problem with the sympathizer of the top of my doctrinal guidance. Learn from John Calvin the rise of the ways of Presbyterianism. Not said that under the guidance of Calvin, Geneva had become the most excellent school of Christianity since the College of the Apostles. Knox determined to bring his findings that he gleaned from his exile in Geneva back to his home in Scotland. But he couldn't do so until 1559 when it had become safer to return because Elizabeth, a Protestant, was now queen in the realm of England. And Knox became a minister then of the great church in Scotland, St. Giles. Piper in Edinburgh. Technically, the ruler in Scotland at the time was Mary Queen of Scots, but it was her French mother, Mary of Hebes, who was acting as regent. Not one so many followers that the civil war between the forces of Mary of Hebes and Protestants seemed inevitable. But then down in France, the husband of Mary Queen of Scots, who was only 17, fell off his horse, and the dolphin of French. France, the heir apparent to the throne of France, died. And Mary was no longer going to ever become Queen of France, and so she had returned to Scotland. She declared that her court would be Roman Catholic, but she would tolerate Presbyterians in Scotland. That was not quite enough for Knox. And they had five audiences, Knox and Mary, but there was very little progress. In the meantime, Mary was trying to position herself in marriage to expand her rule. She was married briefly to Henry Ward Darnley, and the rest of her plans fell through and cannot be a part of our discussion here. If you remember uh, the movie of uh, 40 years ago with uh, Glenn Jackson and Vanessa Redgrave, it was over four hours long. And we're not going to take that much time today. Yeah. Suffice to say that Mary's son. James the Sixth became King of Scots uh, in his infancy, and later on the death of Elizabeth, he became King of England, and that eventually ended up with the United Kingdom. But here's what we want to say about Knox. First, he was the one who brought Presbyterian church forms from their home in Geneva, Switzerland, to Scotland. So the Scottish Church became Presbyterian, ruled by elders rather than bishops. Now, if Knox had not spent his exile in Geneva, suppose, suppose he had gone to Charlesburg and said, maybe he would have returned to Scotland as he was when he served in the court of King Edward, a low church at this scale. But I'm just like you say, Presbyterians believe that our form of government was ruled by elders, and our confessions are good and adequate to the church. But it would be a denial of our Presbyterian heritage to say that we believe that they are the ultimate expression of Christian faith. If Knox could accept bishops in his service as a Scottish chaplain to the head of the King of England, then maybe down the road, as we continue to work for the reunification of the whole Christian church, Presbyterians might just be able to accept the modified form of the Episcopacy. Maybe. Second, Knox was a scholar, and Presbyterians, ever since, have tended to push toward the importance, the importance of truth, educated truth. Not your opinion, but truth at whatever the cost, sometimes in ways that Knox could not have ever imagined. The founders of the American branch of Presbyterian Church reflect Knox in declaring in 1789 words that are in our Constitution to this very day that the truth is next in order to goodness. And the paragraph goes on to say it would be pernicious and absurd to assert that it is of no consequence what a person's opinions are. The legacy of Knox. Is that we cannot abide blatant theological error in the church, no matter if the error temporarily is very successful in attracting thousands of people. Truth, we say, is next in order to goodness, and we must seek it. Not abide by false theology, false science, or what has become known in recent months as alternative facts. Third, Knox could not have predicted 
that generations to follow in his name would find in the Bible good reason to contradict his opinion on the role of women in the church. Not to believe that women should have a role in the church or in civil government. He opposed the succession of princes to queens. In fact, his 1558 diatribe, the first trumpet class against the monstrous regime of women, is uh, something for which he is uh, infamous. Now, now, first of all, the title is not as bad as it as sounds, because uh, if, if you, you put it in modern English, English, it should be the first prophet last against the unnatural civil rule of women. women. Uh, unfortunately, Knox <laughs> was, was actually talking about the rule of Mary Tudor in England, and Mary of East in Scotland, and the future uh, uh, rule of Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, the three Marys. He published this while it was still in Geneva in 1558. Big mistake. Big mistake. It was Elizabeth who in 1559 became Queen of England, allowing Knox to return to Scotland. And Elizabeth never forgave Knox for his pamphlets. And any chance of not having any influence over the direction of the continuing Reformation in England was lost because he published that uh, pamphlet. But not to be debilitated by his time, as we are by ours. He didn't have the advantage of biblical scholarship to the flourish since the 1880s. He was a man of his time. He contributed to some good, and it had faults. We must have some odd flaws that probably resemble some of the flaws that future generations will ascribe to you and me. The church did not forget the wise words of the Apostle Paul, which we read a moment ago from his correspondence to Christians in Corinth. Although we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as the slaves for Christ's sake. God said, Let light come out of darkness, giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in play jars, making it clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God. Does not come from us. Play charts. Fallible people. Like John Knox, like you and me. That's why we must never be like the Pharisee in the parable Jesus taught, who thought that he was so much better than the tax man. No, an essential doctrine, in fact, of the Protestant Reformation is that none of us have any place on which to stand except for the grace of God. What we celebrate today is a particular heritage of one particular and very modified part of God's church. But within the framework of the Presbyterian faith that we inherited from Scotland is a sense that we are not and never claim to be the thumb total of God's church. We are a part of a larger whole that includes Christians with different understandings of church order and different understandings of Christian faith and practice. And they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And also, we will proclaim this, and this is vital. We are defective. Because we are made up of defective Christians. And defective also is every other Christian church or organization, even those that claim to have no defects. Because they are made up of defective Christians. We rely not on our goodness, but on Christ. That's why I love the answer that Pope Francis gave. The first week of his papacy, when a reporter asked him if he would look down the road a few years and project how he would want to be remembered. And I love Francis' answer. He said, as a sinner, 
who has been forgiven. forgiven. So it was not a forgiven sin. sin. No one that he was forgiven, forgiven but flawed, not, never would have wanted to be venerated. He would not be pleased. He would, he would not be pleased. The life size statue of him in bronze today stands within the wall of St. Giles Piker in Edinburgh. Not you, that at all people have feet. Of play. Not one reason, reason that you and I are here today, today but above all, all, far above all, all that, far, far, far above, above that, the reason we are here is the grace, grace of God, God known in Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Together in prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for the ways and grace that you have given to us, for the ways that you continue to redeem us, to help us. To see ourselves in the ways that we have become corrupt and the ways that you help us to move into a new day. Lord, we trust that your spirit is still moving among us and that our darkness, light, comes. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for a heritage where the spirit moves among many voices to discern. Your living presence. We thank you for the women and men who are leaders in our congregation, able to listen to the voices of the past, able to hear your spirit speaking anew. We thank you that we recognize the unity among all churches. Help us to find ways to practically implement that we might share together. 
out of the grace that you have given to us to bring love, hope, and healing, liberation, and compassion, and grace to all people. You have called us, and we are blessed to be a blessing. Help us to continue moving in that light and in that life. You have given to us the blessing of faith. Help us to share that faith with generations that come after us. We live together in your life and look together toward your future. In Jesus Christ, who teaches us as we gather together to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.